we got to ask ourselves. Now, there are wisdoms that our scholars have shared with us when calamity befalls the Ummah. One of the greatest wisdom, takfir al dhunub Removal of sins. Removal of sins. Removal of sins. There is no harm that you go through, even if a thorn pricks you, except that the pain that you feel, Allah uses it as a means to remove your, your sins. Now I ask you, getting pricked by a thorn, good or bad? <laughs> I'm not saying go get yourself pricked now. Huh? But if it happens, if it happens, that pain you feel, Allah is removing your sins. Wallahi, the people, the greater the pain, the greater your sins are being removed and the greater rewards people are getting. If they only knew, we also feel and we must feel. Allah will reward us for it. And we must act as well. Allah will reward us for it. Bismillah. <coughs> right, brothers and sisters? So the first benefit or the first wisdom, let's call it, these are divine wisdoms. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have averted this from Abu Bakr and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba, but no, made them go through it. What are the wisdoms? One, removal of sins. Two, to teach us how to react to harm and not doubt our Iman and Islam because of harm. Because when you and I get harmed today, we don't deny Allah. Why? Because we say the best person to have walked the face of this earth, the man who came with this message, he too experienced difficulty. Not so? We have, we have a, a place of solace. When we're going through difficulty, we say Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went through difficulty. This doesn't mean we should give up Islam. Did he give up Islam? No. Did the Sahaba give up Islam? No. This is where we stick on. This is where we hang on. It gives us willpower. It gives us strength to carry on and continue. This is the lesson. Divine wisdom our scholars rahmatullahi alayhim have cited behind why Allah caused this difficulty to befall Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his people. Allah could have averted it. I'm going to repeat this many a time because we have a situation in the Middle East. So, harm came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions so you and I can look back, study history and say, you know what? This is not a reason to leave Islam. People suffered worse than us and they remained Muslims. And they became great Muslims. The greatest Muslims that walked the face of this earth. Number three, what's the third lesson? Is it the third or the fourth? Fourth lesson. The fourth lesson. It instigates thought. It instigates thought amongst the neutrals especially. When neutrals are witnessing one group punishing another group, what happens? It instigates thought. Say, hold on a second here. You know, especially people of principle. People of principle who want to stand up for justice. When they see one group oppressing the other, it's good for da'wah as well. It instigates thought amongst the neutrals. I'll give you an example. Hamza radiallahu an. Who was he? The uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa How did he become a Muslim? How? Do you know how? Because of the persecution that the Muslims got. He went to defend Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the harm of Abu Jahl. He was told when he was getting into the city by a person, by a female, that look what he's doing to your nephew. Immediately, Hamza was a mighty man. Immediately went to him. I said, what is this? Not knowing the situation, he's come in. He says, no, this is what he's calling to and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. What did Hamza say to him? Leave him for I'm on his way also. Allahu Akbar. Did he meet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yet? No, but look, the neutral who has principles, listen to what's going on. He said, no, I'm upon his way. You leave him alone. You don't touch him. And then he went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and completed his entry into Islam. See men of principle? So look, this is wisdom. Did the da'wah not grow from this? This is, this is benefit. So the harm they were getting was da'wah in fact. Allahu Akbar. Most people do not know. Right? Again, remember the hailstones. There's always good. Yes, yes, what's happening in Gaza? It's bad. 
there's a lot of bad, but there's a good side to it that you and I still, we don't know. It's there. And some that we know from their sins being removed, from da'wah being spread. Right? We saw the Jews in Tel Aviv protesting against the strikes. Right? Support coming up. There's, there's, there's positives that come about. There's positives. As we see the negative, also see the positive. There are positives. And there's greater positives that we will know on the day of Qiyamah. We know this. We know this. There's greater positives we will know on the day of Qiyamah. We know many a hadith about a person who will come in front of Allah and see Jannah and say, Allah from where? Allah will say, remember these du'as you did, I saved it for you. You did this, I saved it. Because you are out of excitement. You know what? You know, insan, huh? This is us. We say, Allah, really? I wish you didn't give me anything in the dunya and saved it for me here. <laughs> now you can say it because now we're there, right? But this is happiness we get. Allah has it for us. You have to have good hope in Allah. I was telling you the other day, Hassan of one. Have good hope in Allah. You prayed your salah, have good hope Allah has accepted it. You made dua, have good hope Allah has accepted it. Not that you ask Allah for forgiveness and then you doubt, may, maybe, inshallah Allah forgave me, you know. I don't know, I'm not inshallah for barakah, inshallah doubt. You know, there's many types of inshallahs nowadays. There's inshallah yes, there's inshallah no, there's inshallah maybe. Huh? You know this, isn't it? I say now when you tell someone, listen, are you coming? Say inshallah, say yes or no, which one? Just uh, make it clear, because it's mutashabih <laughs> al-an. It's, it's become mutashabih, it has many meanings, inshallah. Right? We say, you know, inshallah, Allah is accepted as if we're doubting. No, brothers and sisters, no. You make dua and you know Allah has accepted it. You have good hope in Allah. Allah loves to forgive, you have good hope in Allah. Allah loves to accept my dua, you have good hope in Allah. What are you going to lose having good hope in Allah? Will you lose anything? Will you lose anything? No. You won't. Have good hope in Allah. Wallahi, I know some nights we've read the salah, we've had a headache. Right? We felt weak. Right? We human beings. So maybe perhaps we didn't feel that sweetness, the concentration wasn't there. Then we start doubting. No, Wallahi, the night. No. Have good hope in Allah, khalas. Ya Allah, I tried. Wa inna rahmataka arja indana min a'malina. Huh? Ya Allah, your mercy is, 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 we have greater hope in your mercy than we have in our actions, Ya Allah. Have good hope in Allah. We must have good hope in Allah. Okay? So there's always good, even if we cannot see it. Whatever Allah does, He does good. Write this in gold. Tweet it as well. Whatever Allah does, He does good. Whatever Allah does, He does good. Make it your habit. Calamity strikes you. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Indeed, we are from Allah and to Allah we will return. Lillahi ma akhada wa lahu ma a'ta wa kullu shayin indahu ila ajalim musamma. For Allah is what He took as was for Allah what He gave. And everything Allah causes to exist comes into existence with an expiry date. This is the sunnah of Allah. Everything that comes to exist has an expiry date. And we say, whatever Allah does, Allah does good. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. Ameen. So these were some of the lessons we learned. And as usual, brothers and sisters, what we've learned is far less than what we could have learned. And with that, we come to another incident in the seerah. And that is the incident related to the gathering of the Muslims in a house, a house known as Dar al-Arqam. Dar al-Arqam. A famous house because it became a school and a place of worship and a place of unity and a safe haven, a safe house. This house is reported to be or to have been on Mount Safa and it had a back door which you could enter without anybody noticing. So it was the perfect place for the Muslims. Remember, it wasn't announced by name who and who are Muslims for the Muslims to go and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and learn from the Quran and learn from the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and be united and so on and so forth. I had to share this short incident with you because the lessons are mighty, especially in the 21st century. This house 
or the occurrences of this house came about in which year? The fifth year after Nubuwa. When we study the history of the Prophet wasallam, we have two dates. We have before Hijrah or better, after prophethood. And then we have after Hijrah. Right? The Islamic calendar we have is after Hijrah calendar. After Hijrah calendar, meaning 13 years after Islam, or the, the start of that calendar is 13 years after Islam. Although it didn't come about at the time of the Prophet wasallam, the Hijrah calendar that we have was brought about by who? By Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu The Hijrah calendar that we have, you know we say so many years after Hijrah, after Hijrah. This calendar came about by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspiring who? Umar, Umar ibn al-Khattab. But the calendar starts from the time the Muslims migrated from Mecca to Medina, when the, from the Hijrah, from the Hijrah. Okay, what lessons do we learn from the house known as Dar al arqam Firstly, brothers and sisters, the importance of Salah in congregation, Salatul Jama'ah. We learn this because they gathered here to worship Allah together, together. We learn the importance of Salatul Jama'ah. And what will make us understand the importance of Salatul Jama'ah? I'm not talking about the difference of opinion between the Hanafi Madhab and the other Madhahib and so on and so forth. Or the difference of opinion between the Madhahib with regards to whether it's compulsory and so on and so forth. But no doubt, all of the scholars agree that it's, it has a mighty placement in the religion and it's definitely better than your individual salah. Salatul Jama'ah. What will make us understand, brothers and sisters? So important is salah together that even at the time of war, at the time of war, the other night we were reading the ayat. وَإِذَا كُنْتَ فِيهِمْ فَأَقَمْتَ لَهُمُ الصَّلَاةَ فَلْتَقُمْ طَائِفَ We were reading the ayat of how salah should happen during war. During war. When the enemy is in front of you, how you should observe the salah so you can observe it in jama'ah. Allahu Akbar. Look at that. The enemy is in front of you. But the sharia came with the salah that it can still be done in jama'ah and at the same time, someone will keep watch on the enemy. The, the actuality of the salah is beyond the scope of this class. But it teaches us how important Salatul Jama'ah is. That even in the time of war, subhanallah. Point number one. Point number two. Look at the Muslims. So early on, when they were allowed to keep it silent, they were still told, let's find a place to gather to observe the Salah together. Salatul Jama'ah. And brothers and sisters, look, you know, now you're frequenting the Masjid Ramadan and we Salah together. How does it feel? When you pray salah at home, how does it feel? Is the sweetness the same as when you're with your brothers and sisters? No. Even in the masajid that read short salah, we say, you know what, go pray with the jama'ah. They were telling me in Melbourne, there's some masajid, mashallah. It's like a stretching uh, program, aerobics. Very, it's quick, mashallah. Right? So he says, should I read at home? Looking in the Mus'haf, or should I read with the Jama'ah? I said, well, there's other masajid, but if you can only go to this masjid, still go there. That's the pious predecessors used to say, it's more beloved to me to stand and listen to a few ayat in the Jama'ah than to read the, uh, the, 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 uh, to, to read the Salah by myself at home. SubhanAllah. Unity. Being together. Salatul Jama'ah teaches us unity. For Allah brings us together five times a day. You know, if you look at the pillars of Islam, it teaches us unity. Look at salah, unity five times a day. Look at fasting, unity during one month of the year. Look at zakah, unity with the impoverished. Look at hajj, unity of the ummah in Mecca. Allahu Akbar. Right? Look at the shahada, the greatest form of unity. A unity which is greater than a bond. A unity that creates a bond which is far greater than the bond of blood. Salatul Jama'ah. We learn this, brothers and sisters. Secondly, we learn the importance of having schools. We need schools. Good schools. We need good schools. The right schools. Progressive schools. Schools that are upon the ethos of looking 
at what education can be and not what it is. Good schools. Darul Arqam was a school. Needed to come together in a school. The teacher, the best teacher ever, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The students, the earliest Muslims. That's why we have to discuss Darul Arqam. This house of this amazing man. Al Arqam ibn Abi Al Arqam. We learned the importance of education. We discussed it. But for this particular point, we learned the importance of schools and having good schools. Brothers and sisters, MashaAllah, there's been a revival in terms of Islamic schools. But to be honest, the Islamic schools are in need of Islam to a certain degree. In terms of some of the practices, yes. But when I say Islam, I mean excellence. Remember the other day I said, excellence is the minimum requirement. I call this Islam. Because Ihsan is, is, is in the circle of Islam. Islam means excellence also. Technically. The Islamic school is in need of Islam, meaning excellence. Where the product is amazing. The Muslim that graduates from it is a confident Muslim, an able Muslim, a well-rounded Muslim, a holistic Muslim, a nurtured Muslim. We need this. We need these schools. Look at Dar al-Arqam. The Muslim, early Muslims realized we need a school. They took a house as a school, a premises. We need this, brothers and sisters. As a community, we should not feel we do not need a school. There's enough schools. The public schools are enough and so on and so forth. No. Ask yourself, what can education be? Don't ask yourself what it is and strive to make it. And if you need a school to do it, go and get the school. And if you're able to influence an existing school, that's better because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. It, needs, it takes a lot of money and effort, right? To build another school. But sometimes you can't. Sometimes the school blocks you out. They're not interested. So you have no choice but to go and instigate the, 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 the establishment of another school. Schools are important. And I wish I had such a long time to discuss with you education. Tayyip. What else do we learn? What do we learn from this, brothers and sisters? We learn from this the importance of having good company. Good company, good friends. Remember who the majority, were they Muslims or non-Muslims? Non-Muslims. So a person who's recited the Shahada and is hiding the fact that he's a Muslim, who is he hanging around with? Muslims or non-Muslims? Non-Muslims. So the Muslims needed a place where they could come together and be Muslims. We need good company. We learn this from this. This is when you ponder. We, we want to extract. Let's take from the seerah in the 21st century. We need good company. And you know what? This lesson of good company is not a lesson of the 21st century. It's a lesson from that time as we've seen here. And it's a lesson throughout the ages of Islam. It's something that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us. It's something that the Quran taught us. Do you know the Quran teaches us that we should have good friends and good company? Friends that remember the grave and remember the hereafter. This is what I mean when I say good friends. So their character is in check. When you're with them, they're not only discussing the latest phone and the latest games. <coughs> they also discuss ibadah and salah and the punishment of the grave and the standing in front of Allah on the day of Qiyamah. Do you know the Quran teaches us this? It does. Where? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ Oh, you who believe, be people of taqwa. This is the month of taqwa. We're looking for the means of taqwa. What is the means of taqwa? Having a righteous friend circle. Having good friends. And Rasulullah wasallam taught us the effect of bad friends and good friends upon us and our children. For Rasulullah wasallam said, that the example of a person who has a good companion is like the example of a person who has a friend that sells itar. You know itar? Perfume? You know perfume? Yes. He sells perfume. You have a friend who has a perfume shop. When you go visit this friend, MashaAllah, he's so happy to see you. Allahu Akbar. He pulls out a bottle of oud and he gives you La ilaha illallah oud. Kambudi. Ba'd. MashaAllah. Huh? 
It's expensive. He's given you expensive perfume. A whole bottle. He's so generous. Did you benefit? You did. All right. He's not that generous. Yeah, Annie. He's not that generous. But when you visited him, he took out the bottle of oud and said, Try some. Tafadbal. Jarrib hada. Try some, right? Did you benefit? Yes. Not, not like the first guy who got a whole bottle, but you still benefited. Okay. He's even less generous than this. You go visit him, he doesn't take out a bottle, he doesn't offer you anything. But he allows you to be in his scented perfume shop. The smells are nice. So the smells rub, out on your, rub onto your clothes. When you leave the shop and people see you in, on the street, what will they say? They say, did you come out of that shop? Will they not say that? Did you benefit or not? You benefited. When you have a good friend, you always benefit. Maybe a big benefit like a bottle of perfume. Or medium benefit that you are allowed to try some perfume. Or small benefit, but still benefit because you are in this good environment. Win-win situation. Okay. What about if you have a bad friend? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that the one who has a bad friend or the example of a person who has a bad friend is like the example of a person who has a friend that smells iron. He's an iron monger. He smells iron. When you visit this friend, you might get too close and not be careful and a spark will come out of the blast furnace and burn your clothes. Did you win or lose? Lost. In a big way. Okay, you say, no, he's a bad friend. Okay, I'm going to be careful. You know what? I am going to stand between the door and the blast furnace. Not by the blast furnace, but between the door and the blast furnace. Okay. So you stood between the door and the blast furnace. The black smoke of the room went onto your white thobe and blackened it as well. You didn't burn your thobe, but your thobe became black win or lose lost maybe you didn't lose your whole thobe but now your thobe has got black on it you can't even wash it off okay you say no 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 my parents told me this guy is bad company i'm going to stay away from him you know what i'm, gonna, I'm not going to stay away from him i want to be extra extra careful i'm going to stand by the door <laughs> there's a lot of arabs here brothers and sisters uh, for those in the audience so Alright, so you stood at the door. When you were at the door, where was your nose? Inside the room or out of the room? Inside. So you had to breathe the monoxides in the air. Win or lose? Your thobe is clean, alhamdulillah. But you still got harm, not so? You can never ever win from bad company. Just like you can never ever lose from good company. We learn from Dar al Arqam the importance of Al Jalisa Salih, of having a good friend circle. And you need to do this, brother, parents. You need to do this. You need to check. Even the virtual friends, the Facebook friends, the, what you have, you have to check. What type of friends that we have? Because remember we discussed in the earlier episodes how the child is imitative by nature? If you didn't watch it, go and watch that episode. Your child is going to get influenced. Your wife is going to get influenced. Your husband is going to get influenced. You keep sending your wife to people who live an extravagant life. It's going to rub slowly but surely. It's going to rub onto her. I'm not saying stop them from going if the person is a good company. But advise your family that, look, you know, they have a different life to us. The life they live is not our life. Important to have, to have the discussion. What I'm saying, brothers and sisters, message from yesterday. Do not be naive. Do not be naive. Don't take things for granted that everything will just be. It won't be. There's a system in play. And the system works. The system works. You know, mashallah, as I said, the brothers and sisters, they put me up in the 45th floor here in central Melbourne. I see the whole of Melbourne. The whole of Melbourne. I see people leaving the city in the evening and morning time, Fajr time, they're coming to work. And I'm so high, these cars look like little ants. But you know what? Saturday, I don't see that. Nobody's coming into the city. 
Six o'clock, the roads are empty. Any other day, one after the other, one of like little ants. Wallahi, every street, every system. And you know, from on top, you can see the, 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 code, the driving code in play. How cars just go all of a sudden stop in the middle, then cars are passing, then they stop, this car drives in. Wallahi, I, let me not tell you what I've been doing in my free time. <laughs> I'm sitting and pondering, I'm looking at this and saying, Subhanallah. Brother Raymond visited me the other day. I said, come Brother Raymond, look at this. I said, look, the system is working. It's working. There's a system in play and it works. It works. You hang around wrong company, don't be naive. You will be bitten. You have good company, it will rub on, it will have an effect on you. Wallahi, just in Riyadh, there was a, there was a family, they had a daughter who was getting out of control, subhanallah. And then after some time, I inquired, how is she? They said, she's back to normal. She's become well. I said, what happened? What did you do? What books did you do? She says, nothing. All we did was this other family came from the UK and she befriended this family's daughter and she changed. She started praying, she started not wearing the makeup and so on and so forth. Meaning makeup and leaving the house and you know, in an un-Islamic manner, friends play a part in our life. So we learn the importance of having good company. We also learn brothers and sisters, and this is for our da'wah brothers. I always have to have something for my, for my organizational heads in the audience, right? We learn the importance of having a premises for your da'wah project. Even if it's a room at, at, at your house. Even if it's a room at your house, you need to have a premises. You can't be meeting online all the time. Skype, Telegram, WhatsApp, and so on and so forth. Everything is remote. Blackberry, emails. No, you need the human touch. You need to have a premises where you come together. You need to have that, brothers and sisters, right? You need to have that. We learned this from Dar al Arkham. They had to come together, they had to have the human touch. Be together. We learned this importance of having a premises for our da'wah organization. And now, alhamdulillah, in the age of technology, we have da'wah organizations that are virtual. Virtual. It's on the internet. You open a website, right? And everything, the website takes care of everything. Some people can work remotely, right? But it works better if you have a place that you can meet up at regularly. It works better. We learned this.